Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sharma. Uh, and thank you to the University of Kansas colleagues. Uh, I forget that a number of my favorite collaborators are here at this institution. Also, thank you to all of you for staying. Last talk, did it? Yes, thank you. We, uh, hopefully, we'll this, I will make this worth your while. And I'm a little upset that I didn't have a Taylor sighting while I was here. This was one weekend, a few weekends off, I think. OK, so we're going to talk about antibody drug conjugates. These have been discussed throughout this meeting. There will be some things that I bring up that others have discussed. And then we'll talk about some additional things as well. Uh, I probably don't need to spend any time talking about this, but this is the structure of an antibody drug conjugate, where it's targeting an antigen. There is a linker and a associated uh, payload. And so not all ADCs are the same. ADCs are not new to us in breast cancer. We've had the approval of TDM1 uh, for some time now, both metastatic HER2 positive disease as well as residual disease as well. But then more recently, as you've heard throughout this meeting, we have the approval of other antibody conjugates, TDXD, sesotuzumab govitecan, uh, and, you know, as we see this rapid approval of ADCs, there are a number of questions that are coming up. What are the predictive biomarkers? Is it the target? Is it the payload? How do we sequence? What data do we have? And where is this field moving forward, which is what I'll be talking about. Earlier today, you heard about the evolving treatment landscape of hormone receptor positive advanced disease. I'm not going to spend much time at all about this, because this was part of the initial session uh, that you heard. I'll be able to say that we're seeing you know, new targeted therapies that are also being approved, like l for ESR1 mutations and Capiva serotonin for AKT uh, inhibition uh, for patients with PI3K AKT pathway altered tumors. And then we have uh, ADCs as well. And I'm going to really focus a lot of the talk on hormone receptor positive disease and just give a comment or two about triple negative breast cancer. Um, as we're reviewing some of these data. So we've had the recent definition of HER2 low disease. This really applies for patients uh, in the metastatic setting. This doesn't have any clinical impl implications in the early stage setting. And of course, just to make sure we're all on the same page, HER2 low is just defined as 1 or 2 plus and non-amplified. The prevalence of having a HER2 low tumor is higher for patients with hormone receptor positive disease. It's about two thirds of hormone receptor positive breast cancer. For hormone receptor negative breast cancer, HER2 low is seen at about a third. So two thirds, one third. I know you've heard a good amount this morning and today about TDXD, especially in the context of HER2 positive breast cancer. This is where this drug was originally approved. There is a 8 to 1 drug to antibody ratio. There is a cleavable linker. And the payload is a topoisomerase inhibitor. There's also thought to be, with this particular agent, a bystander effect where there's an impact on neighboring tumor cells. So these are data uh, that you've seen already. But just to reiterate the point that TDXD for patients with HER2 positive breast cancer you know, for somebody who's been treating patients with breast cancer for a long time, this sort of waterfall plot is not something that we commonly see. And uh, it was these sort of impressive data that really, uh, you know, caught the eye of anybody who's treating uh, uh, patients with breast cancer. And of course, we have approval for HER2 positive breast cancer. And those data that I showed you were also recapitulated in the phase three uh, destiny study for patients with HER2 positive disease. But again, I'm going to focus on uh, non HER2 positive breast cancer, meaning HER2 amplified or three plus disease. I'm going to talk about HER2 low disease. So uh, we have destiny breast 04, which was presented now at ASCO a few years ago and published in the New England Journal of Medicine. So these are patients, metastatic disease, HER2 low one to two prior lines of chemotherapy in the metastatic setting. And if patients had hormone receptor positive disease, they must have been considered endocrine refractory. And patients were randomized in a two to one fashion to TDXD, which is given once every three weeks, versus physician choice chemotherapy, with the primary endpoint being PCR. Uh, it, 
looking in patients with hormone receptor positive disease. I already mentioned the prevalence of, of uh, HER2 low disease being higher for those with hormone receptor positive disease. And they also looked at overall survival in that cohort and as well as in all patients. So this is what we saw. This was investigator assessed progression free survival. This is the hormone receptor positive cohort. This is all patients. These are the patients who receive TDXD. This is physician choice uh, chemotherapy. And you can see the you know, notable difference even within the first few months, uh, even shorter than that, just very quick separation of the curve, favoring those patients for progression-free survival for both hormone receptor positive and all patients. And then even more notably, we saw this improvement in overall survival. With uh, this agent, there are some toxicities that we need to be mindful of. The first is nausea. Uh, you know, at my institution, we treat patients uh, aggressively with intravenous anti-nausea medicines prophylactically. I still have a cohort of patients. I don't know if others in this room have this sort of experience. But there's still some patients where this is the main toxicity that we see. And I've had patients who've needed to come back five to seven days later we give them fluids and some additional anti-nausea uh, uh, agents. Uh, also, we can see some neutropenia. We do not see alopecia in all patients. Uh, we can see fatigue. And then the main thing that we really think about is pneumonitis, right? When this agent was originally being developed uh, in that phase one study that was originally presented at ASCO several years ago, there were some grade five, some deaths that were reported specifically due to pneumonitis. And this was something that was on very much in everybody's radar. In the subsequent phase three trials, it was very clear that the message about pneumonitis has really uh, been uh, made to treating physicians, investigators, because we see the rate of um, uh, grade two or higher uh, pneumonitis being less than 10%. But the way that we treat uh, pneumonitis, and, and right now we don't really have any great predictors for the development of who has this particular toxicity. Uh, if it's grade one, meaning patients are asymptomatic, but you see something on the images, you're supposed to hold the treatment until it is resolved, and then dose uh, reduce if it didn't resolve within uh, 28 days. But importantly, if you have grade two or higher, if it is symptomatic, you need to discontinue TDXD. And you should also be giving those patients uh, steroids. And I imagine others in this room have also seen that toxicity. And, and I'll just say in my own experience, I've had a patient or two where, you know, we give the steroids, patients get better, and I've had, and, you know, not re-challenge them, and then they have pneumonitis again. I've seen that happen. I don't know if anybody else has had that occur. So the question is, what about patients who have lower expression of HER2? What about if it's HER2 zero. And so we have data from the DAISY study, uh, which is also a study uh, that you heard about a little bit earlier. Uh, there were different cohorts. What you're seeing here in cohort one are the patients uh, who have HER2 positive disease. These are patients with HER2 low. And these are the patients with HER2 zero. And you can see, oops, sorry. Uh, maybe, maybe you can see. Go back one. Yeah, perfect. Uh, that there are patients who are responding, right? There was a response rate of about 30%. So it does seem like there is some activity for patients with HER2 zero disease, though it is not approved in this indication at this moment. Uh, and from these data, and the other thing that's important to mention about DAISY is that the HER2 status was determined from a biopsy right before patients went on to get that treatment, right? So there's based upon that last right before patients started uh, their trastuzumab direct TCAN. And you can see that the median PFS was longest in green if patients uh, had HER2 positive breast cancer. This is HER2 low, and this is HER2 zero. I will also say at San Antonio uh, this past December, we saw some data from the Dana-Farber and Duke groups that just also looked at uh, HER2 status and, um, in, in their institutional cohorts. And there are two takeaways. One. Their data looked like very much like this. And then the other thing is the uh, amount of improvement on TDXD really seemed to be dependent on whatever that last biopsy was. So if somebody had a primary that was HER2 1 plus 
and then their metastatic, their last metastatic was zero, they didn't seem to do as well in terms of their median progression-free survival compared to if it was reversed. And the other thing that's just worth mentioning is that the subsequent lines of treatments that patients received, their median PFS was relatively limited, including for some of their HER2-positive patients. And when I say HER2-positive, I mean amplified or overexpressed. So we are eagerly awaiting the results of Destiny Breast 06, which includes this patient population who's quote unquote ultra low, meaning they have not zero, and it's not one plus, it's somewhere in between. And uh, patients are randomized in this study, so it's HER2 uh, low, ultra, uh, HER, uh, ultra low, hormone receptor positive, they must have received uh, prior endocrine therapies, and then they're randomized again to TDXD versus physician choice chemo, which includes taxanes. And uh, the median, uh, we're waiting for the results of, uh, of this study, which is looking at progression-free survival. There are other ADCs that are targeting HER2 low. Uh, for instance, uh, these are some data with CID-985, um, trastuzumab duocarmazine, which is no longer in development. Um, the data even for HER2-positive disease uh, and randomized studies uh, were somewhat underwhelming and there were some significant ocular toxicities. And then this is another example of another ADZ, uh, ADC, uh, RC48. Uh, you know, I think, I don't know if there are any pathologists in the room, but I can say that for our pathologists, I think we're, you know, now really driving them crazy between this zero, one, two. You know, I think that the question is, uh, how, despite the many years that we've been arguing about how to define HER2, um, I still think that there's some way to go. And it's, it's also a question of how well we're defining that antigen, uh, that slash gene. All right, so the other thing that I want to mention before moving along is, you know, we have a lot of interest about evaluating uh, ADCs in the operable setting. These are data from the TALENT study that were presented at San Antonio uh, about a year and a half ago. So these are uh, data in patients with hormone receptor positive HER2 low disease, stage one, two, three. And patients uh, could have been either in arm A or arm B. And the only difference between these arms is that arm B received anastrozole as well. And patients received six to eight cycles of neoadjuvant TDXD. And what we saw, so no one had a PCR, except for this one patient here who received eight cycles. There were a few patients who had uh, RCB1. So the data were okay. I would say that these data are okay. You know, for patients with hormone receptor positive disease, when we give them neoadjuvant chemotherapy, the rate of PCR we know is low for patients with luminal A tumors. And so, you know, these are some initial data. We're waiting for other studies with um, EDCs, but these are some of the initial data that we have in the HER2 low context that I would say somewhat uh, underwhelming, if I'm going to make a bold statement on a Saturday. All right, so then let's talk a little bit about sasetuzumab guvatecan. This agent has already been uh, discussed today. So this is uh, targeting trope 2. Uh, it's a hydrolyzable linker, and uh, again, SN38, which is a topoisomerase inhibitor with a similar drug to antibody ratio. Uh, this drug was approved in triple negative breast cancer based upon a phase one, two study, and then a confirmatory phase three. And then there were some initial data uh, that were also published from that phase one, two for patients with hormone receptor positive disease, which led to the Tropics O2 study. So in this particular study, patients were randomized to sesotuzumab guvatecan, which is given uh, two weeks on, one week off, compared to physician choice chemotherapy. Patients must have received at least one endocrine therapy, taxane CDK4-6 inhibitor. One discriminating feature from this study compared to uh, Destiny uh, Breast 04 is just that in this particular study, patients were more heavily pretreated they must have received at least two but not more than four lines of chemotherapy for metastatic disease. Primary point was PFS. And again, this is all hormone receptor positive disease. You can see this median PFS difference of about one and a half months. This did translate into an overall survival difference of about 
three months. Uh, there have been data that have looked at the degree of trope 2 expression, and this was done also for triple negative disease. Uh, I will say that when you look at trope 2 expression, the majority of tumors have some expression of trope 2. So if you look at those, uh, you know, not having expression of trope 2, it's a very small population. And so these really are exploratory. Uh, those patients with low expression may have a little bit less of a response compared to those with higher expression. But right now, this is not something that has clinical utility. We do not tro check trope 2 expression to determine who should be getting these agents or not. And then the investigators from Tropics O2 went back and looked at the degree of HER2 expression, whether it was zero or low. Moral of the story, hazard ratio is about the same. Doesn't matter. So we treat patients with sasituzumab govotecan regardless of their HER2 uh, degree of expression, meaning zero or low. So what are the side effects that we see with this drug? Neutropenia. And there have been some real-world data that were presented at ESMO that also demonstrated that we're utilizing growth factors in about 50% of our patients, um, you know, not as primary prophylaxis, uh, as patients who require uh, growth factor. And I, I feel like in my practice that recapitulates what I'm doing. I feel like I've never given so many growth factors. Uh, same thing about giving prophylactic antiemetics. There's a risk of fatigue diarrhea, and then in my experience, all patients lose their hair. Uh, so it's already been commented on uh, that there are a number of studies that are looking at sasituzumab govotecan. We have data, uh, we have studies rather, that are ongoing in the metastatic setting that are looking at sasituzumab govotecan frontline. So this is triple negative breast cancer, you know, frontline disease. There's one study for patients who are PDL1 have PDL1 negative tumors, and then one for uh, patients who have PDL1 positive tumors. Those are ongoing studies. Then we also have ASCENT07, which is looking at first line SASE versus physician choice chemotherapy for hormone receptor positive disease. Uh, and then we also have uh, SASE -O, uh, IO, um, which is looking at um, uh, the role in uh, patients with uh, metastatic uh, disease as well. Um, that includes both hormone receptor positive and HER2 negative disease with or without Pembro. Um, and this includes some patients with first line, meaning, you know, right after they receive their endocrine therapy. We participated in this study as well, and we're just awaiting the results of this trial. Importantly, we're, there are ongoing studies that are evaluating antibody drug conjugates in the operable setting. There's SASIA which is really a German-led study that is looking for patients with HER2 negative disease comparing SASE versus physician choice treatment. And then there's Optimize RD or Cento 5, which is looking this is triple negative breast cancer, residual disease, SASE plus Pembro versus uh, permutations of Pembro with or without capecitabine. So I just want to move on and talk about uh, other mm, uh, ADCs targeting targeting trope 2. So we have tropion breast 01. We saw these data at ESMO and then at San Antonio. This is looking at DATO DXD. If I were to bet, uh, this, I suspect this drug will also get approved. This is given once every three weeks. So I said SASE is given two weeks on, one week off. This is given once every three weeks. The other thing that's important to make sure we're all on the same page about this study is that, it, again, it was hormone receptor positive HER2 negative disease. But this uh, is the same number of lines as Destiny Breast 04. So it's a less heavily pretreated population than what we saw with Tropix 02. And we saw an improvement in progression free survival as well as a time to subsequent therapy. We're awaiting overall survival data. But the thing to keep in mind with this study when we see those data is that in HER2, trastuzumab direct stecam was approved for HER2 low disease, you know, as the study was ongoing. And we'll see whether or not that has implications in terms of the overall survival data that we will end up seeing. The other thing that I'll say about DATO, if and when it gets approved, is the main toxicity we see from that is stomatitis. And so if you have the DATO DXD, any of these studies open, I would encourage you to utilize prophylactic oral rinse. It really, the steroid rinse, and it really helps prevent stomatitis. Uh, so there are a number of late-stage studies that are looking at 
um, uh, Dato DXD, including in the front line. And then we also have uh, Tropion Breast 03, uh, which is uh, a study that is ongoing with which uh, SWOG is involved, uh, which is a randomized study for triple negative breast cancer comparing Dato DXD with or without Durva versus physician choice uh, chemotherapy uh, um, plus Pembro, permutations of, all, of CAPE versus Pembro versus K plus Pembro. So this is a slide that just summarizes the various things that I said. Keep in mind, uh, all of these are ADCs that are targeting, have payloads that target uh, you know, topoisomerase inhibitor. Uh, we talked about the toxicities and the distinguishing features between these different toxicities. We've seen overall survival advantages with two of the ADCs with TDXD and sesotuzumab govotecan. Dato DXD, we await those data. So this is a, just a treatment roadmap for hormone receptor positive HER2 negative metastatic disease. And I know I think we've discussed this already, except to say if you have a patient who has HER2 low disease that's hormone receptor positive, if I were to start with an ADC, I usually start with TDXD and then give sasituzumab govotequin subsequently, and then I reverse this if it's hormone receptor negative HER2 low. So I mentioned one of the questions that we really have is what about giving ADC after ADC? We saw some data from San Antonio in one of the spotlight sessions. And the take home from these analyses, and these are really you know, institutional series, is that generally that first ADC you do better than the subsequent ADC, but not always. And there are ongoing institutional studies that are looking at sequencing. There are also studies that are being done, for instance, in TBCRC that's looking at sequencing DATO and uh, TDXD that will really help us uh, uh, understand this. But that has also been my experience as well, is that the first ADC, you get a little bit more bang for your buck. In San Antonio, we also saw um, some data from um, now a uh, Merck agent, oops, that was on the timer. Um, so this drug, I think I'll be able to go back, uh, is given every other week. Um, this is in phase three trials. Uh, side effects from this particular agent include hematologic toxicity and some stomatitis. They're not seeing any grade three diarrhea. The other thing I just want to mention before I move on is that in all of the studies, whether it's with the Merck agent, whether it's with Dato DXD or Sasituzumab govotecan, we are measuring TRO2 differently with each of those studies. So the other things that we need to learn is what's causing resistance to TRO2 antibody drug conjugates. The most data we have uh, are from this uh, series oops, uh, that were published from the MGH group. Uh, which identified some mutations in TOP1 and mutations that can develop in TROPE2. Um, the clinical implications, implications of these uh, remain to be tested. And then there's a question about combining agents, combin combining Dato DXD plus DERVA. These are data from the Begonia study, which you can see an impressive response rate in frontline therapy of 80%. Uh, as I already mentioned, there are ongoing combinations looking at IO plus ADCs, including in uh, uh, Tropion Breast 03, the adjuvant study. If we move away from Trope 2 for just a moment, there are other ADCs that are being evaluated. There's also Petrutumab Durex TCAN. It's the same payload as, as we see with Trastuzumab Durex TCAN. This agent is targeting HER3. We saw some data at ASCO about a year and a half ago. The thing to note about this agent is that HER3 expression doesn't seem to be a predictor for who responds or not, and we're seeing benefit across all the different subtypes. There are ongoing studies with this agent in breast cancer, but this drug is really moving forward in lung cancer. And then lastly, before I conclude, I also want to mention, uh, and just keep your eyes out for B7H4 as a target. We've seen some data at uh, ESMO in particular, with two ADCs, um, one uh, HS20089, and another is a Seattle Genetics and now Pfizer agent, um, which have different payloads. 
but they did see some activity. And these drugs are early. Uh, these particular agents seem to have some activity for breast cancer as well as ovarian cancer. And there are other um, agents beyond those that are listed here that are in development that are targeting B7H4. So my takeaways, you know, we have definitely made some advance, advances in metastatic disease with ADCs. We're awaiting future studies in terms of sequencing and understanding resistance mechanisms. And we talked about some antibody drug conjugates that are on the horizon. And I look forward to any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, as you heard, there's a lot happening in ADCs. Um, so we're going to invite our panel up. So in addition to Dr. Klesinski, we'll have Dr. Sharma. And then we're going to have two others join us, um, Dr. Shane Steckline.